the new Ryzen 7000 series processors by now have officially been released and are available for purchase. Since the new CPU generation requires a new socket, you are of course forced into buying a new motherboard. It's just a shame that motherboard prices have gone up significantly for this new generation, especially when looking at those high-end models. Which is why you'll surely often hear one and the same question, which AM5 motherboard is the right one for you at the end of the day, and what are the major differences between, now hold on tight, the four chipsets X670E, X670, B650E, and last but not least, B650. One thing I can tell you right off the bat, you do not need to get the best of the best. Why that is, you'll find out in today's video. Motherboard models. Now, in order to best showcase the differences, I've gotten a little bit of help from ASRock in form of a whopping four AM5 motherboards to go through. These are the ones I will also conduct all my Ryzen 7000 testing, by the way. Representing the flagship chipset X670E is the gorgeous ASRock X670E Taichi Carrara. It at the same time also marks ASRock's 20th anniversary. Just a little fun fact for you. Since ASRock at the time of this video completely skipped on any boards sporting the X670 chipset, we are automatically drawn to the next lower price tier. As a matter of fact, there are even somewhat affordable X670 e boards to have. Among those, the ASRock X670e Pro RS for instance. B650e is being represented by the ASRock B650e Steel Legend sporting a very eye catchy look. Last but not least, for all those that are happy enough with the basic feature set or need to content themselves with it, the ASRock B650 Pro RS. Prices. The prices of mentioned motherboard models I'm now going to list on screen. For the high end solution, you're already forced to spend well over 500 US dollars in October 2022. A lot more concerning to me though is the fact that for the smallest chipset, B650, you already have to shell out over $200. And to make matters worse, we have to keep in mind that ASRock all in all represents a cheaper, more budget friendlier alternative compared to other competing motherboard manufacturers. Let's focus on the technical aspects for a while now. Socket. First of all, the new motherboards now come with the new AMD socket going by the name of AM5. Basically, we're now looking at an LGA socket just like we've seen on Intel platforms for many years now. It's just that the AM5 version comes with 1718 pins. Chipset features. In order to better understand certain decisions regarding ports, slots and the like, and why some of it has been left out, it's important to first understand the maximum base feature set offered by these four AMD chipsets. To make things easier, I've created a nice and hopefully helpful table for you. As far as the aspect overclocking is concerned, AMD does not restrict any manual adjustments regarding clock speeds whatsoever on any of the mentioned chipsets. Same goes for RAM overclocking. We are pretty much free to do whatever we want. The first differences we get to see when it comes to available PCIe lanes in total. While X670E and X670 both offer 44, B650E and B650 only offer us 36. Things start getting interesting and a bit chaotic when glancing over to the new popular PCI Express lanes of the fifth generation. X670E in total offers 20, X670 only a measly 4, B650E all of a sudden 20, and B650 in a worst case scenario, zero. The latter does however depend on the motherboard manufacturer whether or not they decide to completely leave out or even implement PCIe 5.0 as an emergency solution. ASRock for that matter with their B650 Pro RS does not provide any Gen 5 PCIe slot but at least a fast M.2 NVMe SSD slot based on PCIe 5.0. Once again, that depends on the manufacturer and on the model we're talking about. Back to the table. The chipset X670E in theory is capable of offering our graphics cards a single full X16 5.0 slot, 
additionally two at x8. x670 on the other hand provides only PCIe 4.0 at either 1x16 or 2x8. Things look a lot more fairer with B650E, that's 1x16 or 2x8 on a Gen 5 basis. It makes sense that with B650 we are falling back to Gen 4 with 1x16 and 2x8. We witness a whole lot more generosity when it comes to M.2 NVMe SSDs, which does make sense considering we aren't making full use of the bandwidth PCIe 4.0 has to offer for our graphics cards. We can make use of higher bandwidth with fast SSDs however. All except for the B650 chipset, they therefore provide good and blazing fast X4 Gen 5. With B650 we are in theory falling back to 4.0 which is dependent on the motherboard manufacturer and its model at the end of the day as already mentioned before. By making the right board choice you too can enjoy PCIe Gen 5 on B650. USB ports these four chipsets are capable of delivering plenty. That even includes blazing fast USB 4 connectivity at 40 gigabits per second and 15 to 27 watts on paper. Now these are all the differences in theory, but what does all that look like in reality with real motherboards? For that we'll be quickly comparing four ASRock boards. Power delivery. Stated by the manufacturer for the X670E Taichi Carrara is a 24 plus 2 plus 1 phase design with a smart power stage of 105 amps. The X670E Pro RS comes with a 14 plus 2 plus 1 phase design with 60 amps. The B650E Steel Legend with 16 plus 2 plus 1 phases and 60 amps as well and the B650 Pro RS sports a 14 plus 2 plus 1 design again and 60 amps too. Depending on the model, there are differences in terms of CPU power connectors. The flagship model of course brings two 8 pin power connectors to the table, but so does the B650 E board. Memory. All of the mentioned boards come with 4 DDR5 slots and needless to say support dual channel. However, these models differ in terms of supported RAM frequency. While the flagship is capable of handling up to 6600 MHz, the Pro RS version sporting the same chipset does too. That number does decrease on the two B chipsets though. We are talking of 6400 and 6200 MHz respectively. Although that difference in real life isn't really that big of a deal, at least not yet. Expansion slots. From the perspective of the total amount, things appear fairly scarce with just two found on the Taichi Carrara. These are both full PCIe 5.0 x16 slots though. In dual or two-way mode, we are of course looking at x8 x8. The slimmed down x670e Pro RS on the other hand comes equipped with just a single full gen 5 x16 slot does additionally offer two PCIe 4.0 x1 slots via the chipset however. Slimmed down even further is the B650E Steel Legend that's one gen 5 x16 along with a single old school gen 3 x16 slot that only runs at x4. Things look very similar on the B650 Pro RS with one gen 4 x16 and one gen 3 x16 also running at only x4. Storage. That's where a lot of the magic seems to happen. The Taichi Carrara provides a PCIe 5.0 x4 M.2 NVMe slot via the CPU and that's a bandwidth of a whopping 128 gigabits per second. But additionally, via the X670 E chipset, we are being offered three more M.2 slots. These are based on Gen 4 x4 though, therefore offering a bandwidth of up to 64 gigabits per second. The cheaper X670E board does offer us even more M.2 slots to make use of, a whopping 5 in total. One of which also is based on Gen 5 x4, the other three are Gen 4 x4 along with a rather old school Gen 3 x2 slot. The B650E Steel Legend does too provide us a Gen 5 x4 as well as two Gen 4 x4 slots. Even the significantly cheaper B650 Pro RS ASRock 
kindly equipped with a Gen 5 X4 M.2 slot. The remaining two are based on Gen 4 X4 and Gen 3 X2 respectively though. But even popular SATA 6 gigabit per second ports are still provided, even though the amount of such starts to decrease. On the X670E Taichi Carrara, we're looking at 8 ports, albeit half of those are powered by the S Media chip. The X670E Pro RS then only comes along with 6 ports, the B650E Steel Legend with a measly 2, and the B650 Pro RS at least with 4, although these are again split with that third party as media chip. LAN, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Three out of the four motherboards we're taking a look at come with both 2.5 gigabit per second LAN, Wi-Fi as well as Bluetooth. In order to keep pricing as low as possible, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth have been scrapped on the B650 Pro RS. The LAN solution on the Taichi Carrara is based on the quite well-known Color E3100G chip, whereas the remaining models sport, well, a chip by Realtek. That's a bit of a controversial one at times. Audio. After many years, we finally get to witness some change when it comes to audio. You might have already noticed it, we get a lot fewer audio ports than we're used to. To be fair, most of us rarely even needed more anyway. While the Taichi Carrara comes equipped with the newer and in theory better Realtek ALC4082 audio codec, for the other boards ASRock hasn't even gone with the ALC1220 but instead went with the ancient ALC897 codec. I despise and hate the poor audio performance of the 897 and I would consider this inadequate. So if you're asking me, quite a questionable choice of an audio codec. I.O. All four ASRock boards come with an insanely useful BIOS flashback button. The flagship model even offers us enthusiasts a clear CMOS button. Aside from that, the I.O. looks impressive and good on all of today's motherboards, in my opinion. The newer USB 4 ports, however, are only provided by the Taichi Carrara. On the other hand, the other boards do sport a DisplayPort output besides HDMI to make use of the integrated Radeon graphics found on the new Ryzen CPUs. Internal connectors. The Taichi Carrara in total offers us 8 CPU slash pump slash fan headers. The other ones offer 6. A single front USB-C 3.2 Gen 2 X2 header at 20 gigabits per second is what every single one of those four boards is bringing to the table, along with additional USB headers, some more, some less. Even a 5-pin Thunderbolt header is present on the cheaper models, and apparently ASRock does not differentiate between boards as far as the number of ARGB slash RGB headers are concerned. That's three 3 pin 5 volt ARGB and a single 4 pin 12 volt RGB header all across the boards. Bonus features. All these ASRock boards except for the pricey Taichi Carrara feature troubleshooting LEDs. Three of these models come with such. The flagship model instead comes equipped with a nice big debug LED as well as onboard power and reset buttons. Conclusion. Let's get back to the question of the beginning of the video at least for those that managed to make it through here until this point. Basically, I'd go this far and say you cannot do any wrong with any of the motherboards I've introduced you to. That, however, also goes for models of the competition and doesn't solely apply to ASRock's lineup. Nonetheless, there are a few things you should be looking out for when planning on going for specific configurations. For the chipset X670, don't mix it up with X670E, I personally see no real reason for existence. Partially we're being offered fewer features than seen on the B650E chipset. Which is why I believe when spending that much money on a motherboard, you either go for the flagship chipset X670E or simply go down the B650E route. That's why certain motherboard manufacturers simply pass on X670. So does ASRock. They maybe have similar concerns and opinions like I do. So let's just ignore X670 and focus on the main events X670E, B650E and B650. If you're asking me, B650E, even for most enthusiasts out there, might be the best choice to make. 
Such ports are usually much more affordable than their X670E counterparts. They come with excellent PCIe 5.0 support too, which applies both to GPUs and M.2 NVMe SSDs. Even in terms of overclocking, you aren't really making any compromises. X670E, simply put, is an extreme chipset that simply pushes its feature set to the very limit, and that's exactly what's going to happen with our wallets and or bank accounts. Long story short, those of you that simply have plenty of money to spend and want the best of the best, go ahead and grab a kick-ass X670E board. Budget-oriented consumers, on the other hand, that still don't want to drop most of the functionality and essential enthusiast-grade features, simply buy a decent B650 eboard. As far as B650 is concerned, those of you that quote-unquote have the desire to build a normal, somewhat affordable system with Ryzen 7000, pick B650, be it mid-range or high-end. That's because even with a B650 motherboard, you can build a really fancy high-end system. You just need to content yourselves with fewer connectors and ports and potentially fewer upgrade options for the future in terms of lightning-fast SSDs. Honestly, I would certainly consider myself an enthusiast, but do actually have to admit that from a feature perspective, I'd get along just without any issues with B650. At the end of the day, you have to pay close attention to what all these different motherboard manufacturers are offering you exactly in terms of features, ports, slots, and so on. That's because the available bandwidth by the CPU and chipset needs to be split accordingly. Often one aspect is prioritized over another. The CPU performance is not, or rather, it should not be influenced by the choice of chipset we make. So with that said, it's now really time to end this video. It's gotten long enough anyway. I hope that I at least could help one or the other among you. Hopefully I could shed some light on this topic. With that said, thanks for watching and you can soon expect my CPU reviews.